like for you to think about how you can get engaged in a church. So children, you can go downstairs if you'd like. We are going to talk about what Christians lose in sin. Not what Christians do about sin. How, what, what do we lose when we sin? And I'd like you to, still before you go to 1 John 1, verse 8 through 10, which is on page 1864, I'd like to read out of the book of Jude. It's on page 1872. And I'd like to start on verse 5. But I want, I want to remind you, now remember Jude here is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. He says here at the very beginning, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, a brother of James. We know that James was a half a brother of Jesus, and Jude was the other brother. So he is talking to the church, and he starts on verse 5. But I want to remind you, though, you once knew this, talking about salvation, talking about understanding the word, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own adobe, he, was, he has reserved for everlasting chains under darkness for judgment of that great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar man, manner to those having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. There is sin and there is a lot of stuff that we need to do. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. Lord, help us, Lord, as we learn what this means, what it happens when we sin against you. We, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The disciples thought when Jesus went to heaven, when they sat around looking, and what is happening to us as Christians is when we sin, we lose that connection. We lose what God has for us. And in 1 John, chap, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, we read, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not with us. Here John is saying that, you know, we are sinful. We have sinned. Now, as Christians, though, we are redeemed from sin. We're redeemed from our past. We are made whole in Jesus Christ. But what happens to us when we sin? How many of you sinned since you accepted Jesus Christ? How many of you sinned since you've been baptized? How many of you sinned since you woke up this morning? Did you follow the laws driving into work? In this work? You sure? What is this? It's worship. Don't you work for? Don't you work at worship? Isn't there something that you have to actually do to work at it? Don't you have to actually work at being safe and work at not sinning? Why do we sin? Because we're human. Nature. I'm going to tell you why we sin. Because we like it. Because I guarantee you, if you don't like it, you wouldn't sin. I don't like lima beans, so therefore I eat lima beans every day, right? No, I don't eat it. And there's some people in here that don't like chicken. What do you do? You don't eat it. 
So then why as Christians, knowing that we've been redeemed, why do we still sin? Why can't we change our attitude and work at a place where we can move forward and become more and more enthusiastic about not sinning and being an example to Jesus Christ, for, for Jesus Christ to the world? The Lord deals with sinners and Christians differently. Do you know that? There's a different situation between a sinner, a non-redeemed person, and a redeemed person that accepts Jesus Christ and sins. First, God deals with sinners judicially. In Romans 6, 28, it says, the wages of sin is what? Death. So those that do not have Jesus Christ, they are what? Going to what? To the second death. Anybody know what the second death is? Is the separation from God. We will die in the flesh. We will die here. But Christians, those that are redeemed, will never suffer the second death which is the permanent separation from God. Sinners will be that, and they will be judged. This is a judgment of guilt. Once we sin, we've already found the sentence. We are already sentenced to death, but at judgment, it is proclaimed. Have you ever seen a court case with a murderer? They, they're found guilty, right? And then they have another hearing for what? for the sentencing, for the arraignment. Well, every human being has already been judged for sin. And that is judgment of what? Death. So how do we get out of that? We get out of that through the blood of Jesus Christ, through faith in grace and through our understanding, we get out from that sentence. So now... The first, God deals with sinners in a judiciary way. He passes sentence on them, and they are guilty. We are guilty from the moment we start sinning. It is not a matter of fact of a, an attorney or a district attorney proven to, the, to God that, oh, yeah, look at this guy. Look at George or Charlie or, I'm going to be careful with names. I'm not talking to nobody in the congregation, okay, or online. What are you saying? Well, you got to prove that I sinned, God. So my attorney goes, well, God, there's no evidence. Where's the evidence? You are guilty the moment you sinned. And the passing of the sentence will happen at the great white throne, and it's going to be through eternal lake of fire. And if you're waiting until that moment, like some organizations teach, that at the judgment seat, you can justify yourself. If a murderer, can he change his mind after he murdered when he's standing in front of a judge? He's murdered, right? He's guilty. He can't change his mind later. And no matter what the attorneys now, well, except for today, you know, things may be a little different today. They might even give you a medal today, depends on who you kill. But the judiciary in the court says, in Romans 6, we talk about it. But now, what happens with the Christian? God deals with Christians differently. In Proverbs 13, 24, anybody know what Proverbs 13, 24 is? Come on, every parent should know this one. Pop. Spare the rod. Spoil the child. What is the philosophy of today's teaching to children? Don't spank them. You know, my mom, we had seven, in my family there was seven of us. My mom used to joke that she used to keep a belt around her neck. And she was spanking one of, us, one of her children every day. If it was, you know, it, it was Billy, Sarah, Lee, Mara, Alda, nah. <laughs> so what does he do? He, chast he goes in and he talks to the rebellious children using a proper thing. And that is what God does to us when we sin. He is not condemning us. Now I'm going to explain something real quick. 
What I'm talking about, and many people misunderstand sermons. I will tell you this. If after a sermon you feel condemned, then you're listening to the devil. It is not the Holy Spirit talking to you. It is the devil speaking to you. And the devil can be speaking from today's pulpit many places, many places around the world, even from here. How many of you prayed for me this morning? You know, the devil could have gotten a hold of me last night. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you're hearing something and you get convicted, that's the Holy Spirit. Condemnation means destruction. That is the first part of this. If you feel condemned, then you need to fight that devil because you need to get into spiritual warfare because no Christians can be condemned. The Bible says there is no condemnation in those that believe. So what do you have? You have a conviction. So what do I do with a conviction? I change. I repent. I seek God. I seek the Holy Spirit. And I try to get that conviction off of me. Conviction is the Holy Spirit talking to you and me that we're doing something wrong. And that we need to change. Too many churches across America today are saying... Once you're saved, you're always saved. Don't worry about it. Live the life the way you want to. Many people get upset at sermons. They get condemned. No Christian can be condemned. The devil does not have that authority on your life. The Holy Spirit will come and convict you and tell you what you've done wrong. All you have to do is follow what the Holy Spirit tells you. There's times... When the Holy Spirit will tell you, just ask the Lord for forgiveness. And you get on your knees and you ask God to forgive you for your sins, for your thoughts, for your actions. There's other times that God tells you to do something. Maybe you need to go to somebody and apologize for what you've done. If the Holy Spirit is leading you down that road, then do it. But many Christians... Every Christian, we still sin. And the reason we sin is we still have the old man living in us. We still have the old desires living in us. We still have that rebellious spirit living in us. And that spirit is constantly fighting the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is always there trying to tell you how to control your spirit, how to control your temper. Hardest thing in the world, James says it, is what? How to control your tongue. There's a sermon coming up about how we cuss, but we cover our cussing. Anybody know how we do that? Jiminy Cricket. Oh, shoot. Golly bee. You're still cussing. You just changed the name of it. You think that, think, oh, yeah, I got over with it. I didn't say the bad word, but you're still cussing because the intent behind it is still there. We're sinning, but we can't be condemned by it. We can only do what? Be convicted, and our God is gracious to forgive us. That's why you can't be condemned. That's why you are what? Being convicted. We go back to King David, classic example of King David sinning. Did he have to do, did, did God forgive King David? Was there a consequence to his sin? Absolutely. And many Christians feel because of the consequence, we're not saved. Or God hasn't forgiven us because we're still living under that consequence. You lose your temper at work. You cuss out your boss. And you get fired. You come to church. You, uh, the Holy Spirit talks to you. You repent. And the Holy Spirit is gracious to forgive you. But does that guarantee you you get your job back? No. There's a consequence. And there's always a consequence to our sinning. 
to our, the way we act and the way we do. King David, we know about him. What about the prodigal son? Did he sin against the father? Was there a consequence to that sin? But then when he came back, was there a redemption? Now, the prodigal son came back, and what did the father do? Kill the fattest cow, prepare a meal for him, put him in clean clothes, put a ring on his finger. And I, I was studying this. I'm going, wait, well, Lord, that's not fair. The prodigal son rebelled against the father, went out, destroyed his inheritance, comes back with a repentant heart, and the father puts him right back in the same position he was before he left. And where was the consequence to that sin? King David repented, came back to God. He had a consequence to pay. So I don't know how God is going to deal with your sin. All I'm telling you is recognize your sin, repent of your sin, turn your life back over to the Lord, and let the Lord deal with you as a father, not as a judge. One of the truly great and far-reaching blessings of salvation, I believe, is dealing with sin. We all have sinful thoughts, sinful ideas. But here's what you got to understand. A repentant sinner is immediately saved from the penalty of sin. Again, we talked about what is the penalty of sin? Death, separation from God, permanently. The moment that you repent, you are cleared from that penalty of sin. But not necessarily the what? The consequence of the sin. Sometimes we got to deal with that. I believe that when my boys were being rebellious against me was a consequence of when I was rebellious to my parents when I was young. And what I tell my boy the other day, Jimmy, I said, that's all right, Jimmy. You got little Jimmy and you got Olivia. You're going to know. What's funny was Jimmy and Johnny were talking, and Johnny, of course, my youngest son, has, don't have no children, don't have a wife, and he's talking about how parents are, and Jimmy says, I mean, Johnny, Jimmy told uh, Johnny, he goes, Johnny, you don't know nothing until you have kids. But it's how we deal with it. A repentant sinner, is he, a, is he still a sinner? The Bible says if you, if you say you're without sin, you are a what? A liar. So I'm a sinner redeemed by the blood, covered by the cross, raised on the third day with Jesus Christ, and I've been made alive through his sacrifice. Therefore, I wear the righteousness of Christ and not my righteousness, because my righteousness is filthy rags. I'm still a sinner. Sin never goes away. God says, anybody know what color sin is? Isaiah 118, scarlet. For your sin are scarlet. What, is, what, what, is, what color is scarlet? Red. What happens when you have red writings on a piece of paper and you cover it with red ink over the top of it? What happens to that, that writing? It washes out, right? This is our sins. Our sins are still here, but the blood of Christ covers them and washes our sins away. Our sins are still there. It's just covered by the blood. So how does God deal with Christians that sin? What happens when Christians neglect the most, I think one of the greatest powers that God has given the Christian is the power to overcome sin. What happens when we don't use that power? 
What happens when we stay in rebellion? And how does God view us as his child? How does God look at us? Many of us make judgments. We see people coming and going from church. We see people. I saw this thing writing the other day. I thought it was really great. When you see a broken Christian, a one that has fallen away from grace, one that has left the church, gone into all kind of sinful actions, and then that person finally finds the courage to come back to the cross, finds the courage to say, Lord, I have sinned against you. Forgive me. And they walk back into his church. What normally do the people do then? Look at her. Do you know what she did? Do you know what he did? I'm going to tell you right then, those church members need to get to the cross. And they need forgiveness. Because if my God, my Jesus, the creator of the universe, has forgiven that person, who are you or who am I to judge that person now? Unless you think you're greater than God. How many of you think you're greater than God? How many think you're more powerful than God? How many of you look at the inward person? You see a person walking up to you, what do you look at? Who he is, how he walks, what he does. But you see, thank, thank God and thank Jesus Christ that he looks on the inside of us. He looks at the heart. And you know who I got to justify myself to? Not, not a single person in this congregation. Not a single person listening on the internet. I have to justify my actions to an almighty God that is gracious to forgive me of my actions and loves me unconditional. But I have to repent. I have to come back to him. Sin has an effect on all of us. So what do we lose when we sin? Well, the first thing, we lose the loss of light. We lose the ability to see things the way God wants us to see things. When we're living in sin, we get this covering and we lose the ability to see and we lose the ability to understand and let the Holy Spirit guide us. We walk around blind. Not that we are condemned, but we're blind because why? Because we have sin in our lives and that we need to get clarification and understand what God wants us for us. In 1 John 1, 6, it tells us that we get preoccupied. We get all these other things and we start pursuing self-righteousness. And we start justifying our actions. I talk to many drug addicts and alcoholics. And they say that the temptation comes so strong that, you know what, it's, it's only one drink. It's only one puff. It's only one thing. It's just to knock the edge off of it. The devil comes to you, it's just one sin. It's just one trip down that road. It's just one time. How many counseling sessions have I had when the husband, even the wives have come to me and says, well, it all started with a kiss. It all started with one thing. And it led to a disastrous results. <clears throat> we, lose the, we, we lose our joy. Christians become discouraged. They start believing a lie. You start getting down and beat on. You start feeling like you want to give up. You lose that peace and that joy that's in you. You lose that 
time of fellowship. And I think, I think we lose our joy because we lose that real connection with God, that real connection with the Holy Spirit. I love new Christians. You know, they're so eager because they're just on fire. What happens to our fire? What happens to our desire? Because we started trailing into sin. What else do we lose besides peace? We lose fellowship. We can lose fellowship with our fellow believers. We can lose fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We can lose fellowship with God. And I heard many people have come back and have come and repented. And they says, you know what I missed the most when I was walking down those dark roads? Is that close fellowship with God. It seems like I can't talk to him anymore. Or it seems like when I pray, it's just emptiness. It seems like the time. You know, I remember when I was younger and I was still had my business, and I'd pray. And I would imagine Jesus standing there in front of me. I would pray so I felt like I was so close that sometimes I felt like I could smell the fragrance in the room. And then after a while, you become legalistic. You start doing things by rules and regulations. Instead of from the Spirit of God, you lose that connection. You lose that love. You lose that connection with the church. When you start losing all of these things, I'm going to tell you something, you're in trouble. It's serious trouble. And you're vulnerable now to the seducing power of the spirit of the dark side. And I think it can even lead to bad health. It can lead to things that you're not used to. It can, bring, it can lead to psychological issues. I don't know how many people have testimony. I've heard in our churches that when they come to church and they came to Christ, they got that fellowship with God, and they were no longer on drugs that, for their psychological problems. The doctors have taken them off those drugs because they were healed. The relationship to have with Jesus is deeper than any relationship you can have with a human being. And if you understand that, you can go through those storms. I used to sell wedding rings. I remember a guy came up to me and said, well, I need to buy an engagement ring. And I said, okay, what do you want? He gave me the stuff, and we got it to him. And he says, what type of warranty do you have on this ring? And I says, well, I guarantee you that it is 14 karat gold, and I guarantee you that the diamond is real. No, I want to guarantee. What if my marriage don't work and I bring it back? You know what I told him? Your marriage is doomed already. You're finished already. Don't even start down that road. Many Christians feel the same way. They come to Christ, but then they start saying, Pastor, what guarantee do I have? I can't give you a guarantee. There's only one person that can give you a guarantee that you, you have a place in heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. And that is through his blood, and that is through your obedience to his word. Christians need to understand that they can have assurance. The Bible says, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you trip and fall, how many of you ever learned how to ride a bicycle? How many of you, when you first time got on the bicycle, right, what'd you do? Boom. Oh, that's it. I'm done. I can never ride a bicycle. What do you do? Get up, get back on the bicycle. Eventually, you're riding. I remember the boys, when they were learning how to ride a bike, I said, oh, it's great. I remember the first time we had to take the training wheels off. I was so proud of them, riding the bicycles. And about a week later, I'm sitting there going, oh, no. They're trying to make jumps now. All right, get back to the training wheels. I still remember with Jimmy, he said, 
he had to set up a ramp, and the garage was there, and he was going to go out the back door. He goes, he's flying, he jumps, he lands, he misses the door about this far, it rams him to the wall. And I looked at him and said, you take after your mother. But sometimes we do that as Christians. We get that extra confidence and we go and do things and sometimes we hit the wall. What do you do? Get up and learn. I wouldn't say do it again because, well, some people may have to hit that wall four or five times. I'm probably one of them. Salvation by grace is a gift to Christians with the mind of Christ and indwelling Holy Spirit which is personal and perpetual. In other words, it, you guys can get it back. All you have to do is recognize, Lord, I've lost my joy. Lord, what's taken my peace away from me? And then comes the devil. It's the church you belong to. It's this, it's that, it's that. If your peace is found in the congregation of this church, this church is going to disappoint you. Your peace must be found in the presence of God, in the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ. And then the gates of hell cannot tear you down. You can come out victorious. As a matter of fact, Christians often wrestle with the need to know that they're saved. Many get down, down, get disappointed. Some many times people have come to me in my office and says, I just don't feel saved. I feel lost. Your salvation is not dependent on your feelings. Your salvation is dependent on your belief that Jesus Christ died on the cross and that his blood is sufficient to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You have a bad feeling. How many grew up in your, in your how, how many of you have, how many of you sometimes was upset at your parents? Okay. You know, my granddaughter told her mother, my daughter-in-law, mommy, I want a new mom because I don't want to go to bed at the right, at that time. But I thought about it. I think, don't sometimes we say that to God? God, you know what? I think I just need another place to go. I need something else. So what did Kristen do? She went on Facebook and put an ad out, needing a new mother. You know, she took a joke. She laughed about it. Because Why? Do you think that mother, because the four-year-old or five-year-old was mad at her, do you, think, do you think she's just going to disown her automatically? No. What does she do? Forgive them, hug them, pick them up, laugh it off. You know? We do that with our salvation. Many people are wondering... I've lost that feeling. I've lost that closeness. And my question to them is a couple things. One, what are you doing? What has taken you away from the fellowship of God? And many times, it's our family issues. I got a son right now that's angry at God because it messed up his future. He says, Dad... I go to church, I believe in God, I, we prayed, we went through a 24-hour prayer session before I went to West Point, I went to church at West Point, I studied the Bible, I did exactly what God told me to do, and now I'm getting kicked out of the army on a medical. And he's angry at God. Now, trying to tell him 
that maybe God's got other plans for him. And he will realize that one day, hopefully. I'll be praying for him. That he doesn't turn this anger into bitterness. But when we start feeling that way, we start feeling vulnerable and hopelessness. Doubt starts coming into our mind and starts to bring this fear. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit has zero tolerance of doubt. Either you have the Holy Spirit or you don't. Either you believe or you don't. How many of you here believe that you're an American citizen? Okay. How many of you sometimes doubt that you're an American? Come on. Are we always happy with the government? Are we? No. But you're an American. You are a Christian. You are a born-again, believing Christian. Jesus called you by name. If you trip and fall, he's always there to pick you up and bring you back. We need to know. You see, read the word of God. There's a man on the internet asked me about faith. He says, why do I have to have faith in the word? I says, because if you don't trust the word of God, which is your compass, how are you going to fulfill what God has called you to do? How are you going to be filled with his grace? There's many pressures in our life as Christians. But I think one of the attacks that the devil is doing is two things. One, Christians and the church are losing their fear of God. They think they can do whatever they want to, and there's no fear, there's no consequences. When you violate the commandments of God, when you violate the word of God, you will get spanked. He will correct you. You know, I said this many times before. I wish I had more sensitivity in the spirit. You know, I'm one of those guys that the Lord tells you in a very quiet whisper, Jim, don't do that. I keep doing it. Jim, don't do that. Keep doing it, then you go, Jim, don't do that. I still keep doing it. Then all of a sudden I get a two by four. Go, bam! Oh, you talking to me? How many of you felt that way? God is talking, we're not listening. Are we obeying the word of God? We inherit an immeasurable treasure through the grace of God, but yet we willfully walk away from it. When we find ourselves in the debt situation, first thing we do is pull a credit card or try to borrow the money instead of asking God to help you. Maybe you made a bad decision. Maybe you made bad decisions in young life, and now you're paying the price at your older age. But there's always redemption in Jesus. There's always hope in Jesus Christ. And through his grace, and his grace alone, can we come out of this. There are certain things to look for if you're saved. Now, I want you guys to think about these questions. Don't answer them out loud. Don't raise your hands. Just answer it to yourself. These are the questions that brought me back to Christ when I was 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, at a little Baptist church. I remember the pastor asking the questions. One question he asked is, have you enjoyed spiritual fellowship with God, with Christ, and have you had fellowship with other believers? Yes or no? Do you have a sensitivity to sin? Do you recognize immediately when you sin? Yes or no? Are you obedient to the commandments of scriptures? Honor thy father with all of them. 
Do you remember the Sabbath? What is your attitude towards the world and its values? Do you practice sinless? Not sinless, practice sinless. Not sinless. How do you profess your faith in Christ? Have you experienced answered prayers? Do you have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit walking with you? Do you have the ability to discern spiritual truths and error? Do you believe in the basic doctrines of the faith that's written in scriptures? Have you ever experienced persecution for your Christian position, either at a job or with friends or families? Ultimately, do you find yourself gravitating to the Word of God for counsel, comfort, direction, and instruction, or do you gravitate to the world of psychology? If you answered yes to all of these questions, you are saved, period. If not, then know that you can say yes to these questions. You can be saved. God is willing and able to save you and willing to work you through those things. I remember one question he asked me, he says, do you have a hunger to read God's word? I sat there, I said, no. Do you have a hunger to reach the lost? I'm, honestly, I sat there in that pew and I looked at him and I said, that's what you're paid to do. And he says, if you said no to any of these questions, he goes, I'm not judging. I'm not passing judgment. But may I suggest something to you? Go to the cross of Jesus. And say, Jesus, here I am. I have sinned. And I have come short of your glory. Forgive me. And he is able to forgive you. God will answer. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. The assurance of salvation, Matthew 24, verses 10 through 14. Page 1530. And then when we'll be offended, we'll betray one another and we'll hate one another. And many false prophets will receive and receive many. And because of lawlessness all around, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures, let's talk to the Christian now. Those of you that endure, that hold on to your faith, to the end, shall be saved. Not might be saved, shall be saved. And if any of these doubts come in your mind, tell it to leave. I am not saved by feelings. I'm saved by the fact that my God sent his son to die on the cross, paid my penalties of my sin, washed me in the blood. That's a fact that is not feelings. I am saved because I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Not by my theology or how much knowledge I have or how I'm feeling. It's a fact. Many will disagree with me. When people say, well, your fact is based on Scripture. I say, yeah. And he says, well, that's just a written word. And I says, okay, who was the first president of the United States? Come on, guys. You're, you're in America. You should know this. George Washington. Prove it to me. Prove it to me. Can you prove to me that George Washington was the first president of the United States? It's written in a book. And every one of you here believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States because you read it in a book. So what's the difference with me saying, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins because it's written in a book? How many would argue Lincoln was never a president of the United States. You better go back to school. 
And we'll close with Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. There's where your anchor is. Am I keeping the word of God? Am I studying the word of God? Am I believing the word of God? Church, I'm telling you, believe the word of God. If a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, a commentary ever says anything that goes against the word of God, you reject that teaching. Even if it comes from Jim Law. So how do I know that I'm not being taught by a false prophet? Read it in the book. I remember when we had that power team in North Carolina. We had hundreds of kids come to Christ. Hundreds. And I remember the guy that was, that was given the ministry. He sat there, he asked me, he says, do you want to do the invitation? I said, no, nah, you do it. He gets up there. He's a big old broody guy. Has the Bible, looks at the kids, and goes, is your name in the book? If your name is not in the book, you're not going to go to heaven. Your name in the book, except Jesus Christ. And hundreds of kids came forward. I'm going, are you serious? But you know what? That's the message. Is your name in the book of life? So if your name's in the book of life, don't let sin discourage you. Repent. That's all. Ask God, say, Lord, am I doing anything wrong? In our morning prayers, says, Lord, we do the Lord's Prayer, we do the extended word, word uh, the Lord's Prayer. I've taught it here a couple of times. And I pray it. I said, Lord... Forgive me of my sins. Lord, forgive me of my sins that I committed that I don't even know I committed. Because I, I, may, I may say something to somebody and may have offended them, made them mad at me, and I don't even know I did it. Forgive me, Lord. You know, in my house, it's, you know, it's facial expressions. Tina does something, I go, oh, there you go again. I know none of you guys ever do facial expressions when your wife tells you something. Repent. You know, it's so easy. Why do we make it so hard? Christians should be the most happiest people in the world because we know that the book tells us that whosoever believes in his name shall be saved. Hard times will come. Struggles will be there. Things will happen. Consequences are there. But rest assured that you've got a Savior that will not abandon you, will not forget you, will always be there to pick you up. And maybe he's there wiping a tear off your face and saying, son, daughter, I got this. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive us, Lord, if we've sinned. Lord, if we've just forgotten the mercy that you poured upon us, remind us every day, Lord, of your grace, of your love, of your compassion. Let us walk hopefully in your presence, oh, Heavenly Father. Let's boldly go into your presence. And, Lord, if I have sinned, forgive me, Lord. Bring to mind anything that I've done to offend you, that I may bring it to the altar and that I may bring it and have your grace cover my life, my family, my children, my church, my city, my county, my country. Lord, let us return to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.